fellow teachers, and welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and I want to thank you sincerely for inviting me to be a part of your scripture study or your lesson prep this week. My goal is to help you study and teach the scriptures with more relevancy, impact, and power. And I know that we're living in troubling times right now. And at times like this, I feel that it's vital that we turn to our Father in heaven, shore up our faith, and open our hearts to receive his love and comfort. And this is a special week. We won't be covering a sequential block of scripture this time, but we're going to take a more thematic approach as a way of celebrating Easter. Our focus then is going to be to study what the Book of Mormon adds to our understanding of the atonement and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Before we start, though, remember that if you'd like printable lesson plans based on these videos or the PowerPoint slides or handouts that I use to make them, go to teachingwithpower.com and you're going to find links to the channel, the blog, and the shop. And if you haven't done so yet, I would love it if you subscribe to the channel. So let's go ahead and dig deep. In this lesson, we're going to be referring to scriptures from all over the Book of Mormon. And you'll notice that we've already discussed some of these verses in previous videos, and we're going to hit some of them again in future lessons. But there is value in stepping back and taking a big picture look at what the Book of Mormon teaches about the atonement. And does the Book of Mormon really have anything unique to add to our understanding? In a word, much. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland has said this. He said, Much of this doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ has been lost or expunged from the biblical records. It is therefore of great consequence that the Book of Mormon prophets taught that doctrine in detail and with clarity. So we are especially blessed as members of the church to have Latter-day Scripture help us better understand the restored doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ. And there's an icebreaker that I often like to use when I teach anything about the atonement. I think it's a good way to introduce the subject because what you're about to do is to attempt to explain something that in many ways is unexplainable. The doctrine of the atonement is so deep and far-reaching and beyond our human comprehension that it's really difficult to, to plumb its depths and climb its heights. It's like trying to wrap our mortal minds around the concept of infinity or a universe with no beginning or end. I just don't think that any of us really, truly understands exactly how the atonement works. So I sometimes like to use the analogy of the cell phone. So I pull out my cell phone and I ask if anybody knows how it works, how I'm able to use this small handheld object constructed from the raw materials we can find lying on and in the earth to communicate with my friends and family, sometimes on the other side of the world. The fact that I can type a simple message, hit a button, and almost magically they can see and respond to that message hundreds or even thousands of miles away. It just blows my mind. How can it store and play every song I've ever liked in my entire life? How can I watch television and movies and play a game of chess with somebody in Australia and have access to the extent of the world's knowledge in one small package. How does that work? And usually nobody can explain it, at least not very well. Sometimes I'll have somebody who's a little more technically minded may scrape together something about ones and zeros and radio waves and everything. But still, I have never really gotten a great answer to that question. Most of us, myself included, have no idea how a cell phone works. But then again, that's not exactly true, is it? Come to think of it, I know exactly how a cell phone works. I push the on button, and then it does all these amazing things for me. To me, that's kind of like the atonement. I don't think I could really explain exactly how it works, the ins and outs of its power, all the whens and whys. But I do know for sure two things. I know how to access that power, and I know that it works. I know the on button, and I know that it's effective in my life. We don't have to understand all the mysteries of the atonement in order to access its amazing power. We just have to push the on button and have faith in its ability to help us. That being said, this shouldn't keep us from studying the atonement and seeking to internalize its significance. I remember when I was younger, even into my teenage years, that I would hear adults and my parents 
and other people speak or bear testimony of the atonement. And they would speak in hushed tones, sometimes accompanied by tears, and, and always a great sense of solemnity. And I'll be honest with you, at that point, I didn't get it. I could sense from the way that they spoke about it that this was an important thing and that I should feel awed by it. But you can't manufacture that feeling and connection out of nothing. It just seems so personal to them. And it made me wonder how the suffering of one man in a garden hundreds of years ago could have such personal significance to people centuries later. Well, a lot has changed since then, and I've had a few experiences and enlightening moments in my life that have helped me to connect on a deeper level with my Savior and my Redeemer. In some measure, I get it now. Now I understand why they spoke about it the way they did, and I truly do feel that sense of awe and amazement. If any of you can relate to that, my goal is to help you to find more personal meaning in the atonement of Jesus Christ. And the best way to do that is to connect your real-life experiences to the doctrines and the truths of the atonement, to liken the scriptures unto yourselves. And I'm going to do that by asking you a series of personal questions. If you can answer yes to any of these questions, then really, the atonement is for you. Have you ever lost a loved one? Do you or does somebody you love suffer from any physical or mental illness, disability, or injury? Have you ever sinned or wished for a release from guilt? And do you experience difficult challenges, trials, or carry burdens in your life? If you can answer yes to any of those questions, I want you to know that the atonement is there for you and can help you. We're going to take each one of those in turn. And yes, I understand that there are many ways that we can apply the atonement. But I'd just like to focus on these four aspects. So first question, have you ever lost a loved one? Has the premature or sudden departure of somebody that you love shattered your world or, or shaken your faith? Well, the atonement's there for you. Jesus performed many miracles in his life. He walked on water. He multiplied the bread and fish. He healed the leper. He cast out devils, caused the blind to see, the lame to walk. And he even raised a few people from the dead. But the greatest miracle that Jesus Christ ever performed was raising himself from the dead. And because of Christ's resurrection, you and I, and all we know, will also be raised from the dead. And the Book of Mormon helps us to understand that doctrine of the resurrection much more clearly. In Alma 22, 14, And that he breaketh the bands of death, that the grave shall have no victory, and that the sting of death should be swallowed up in the hopes of glory. When my mother died in her 50s, we were devastated as a family. My father said that his faith was tested in a way that it had never been tested before. Before that time, resurrection was more of an abstract idea. But now, that doctrine meant everything. Now, it needed to be true. And all these kinds of things. Untimely death, war, murder, natural disaster, disease, and accidents become almost unbearable tragedies without the hope of the resurrection. I love how Alma refers to it as the sting of death. If you've ever been stung by a bee or an insect, you know how painful that can be. It's a sharp, pulsating, burning pain. But with time, eventually it subsides. The effects of it aren't permanent. That, in a small way, is kind of like the death of those that we love. Those of us who are left behind are stung, and it hurts dreadfully. But the effects of that sting are not eternal. Jesus Christ has defeated the grave, and as difficult as that pain is, it can be and is swallowed up in the hopes of glory. The faith we have that we will see and have and hold our loved ones again keeps us going and soothes the ache of that sting like an antiseptic. Death is a temporary separation, not an eternal one. 
Another doctrine that's beautifully clarified by the Book of Mormon is that everybody will be resurrected. There's no single individual in all of human history that will not receive that gift and that victory over death. 2 Nephi 9.22 And he suffereth this, that the resurrection might pass upon all men, that all might stand before him at the great and judgment day. Alma 11.44 Now this restoration shall come to all, both old and young, both bond and free, both male and female, both the wicked and the righteous. And then Alma 40, verse 4. Behold, there is a time appointed that all shall come forth from the dead. Now when this time cometh, no one knows, but God knoweth the time which is appointed. Therefore, there is no need to fear that there will be people you will never see again. As difficult as it was to lose my mom, I find real comfort and hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I can honestly tell you that there have been times when I felt her close to me. I know she's not really gone. Her presence, her spirit, her personality, her love really aren't that far away. And I've felt that before. And one day, I know that I'm going to turn around and there she's going to be. And we're going to embrace and cry and talk with each other and enjoy each other's company once again. Joseph Smith spoke of what that moment might be like. So plain was the vision that I actually saw men before they had ascended from the tomb as though they were getting up slowly. They took each other by the hand and said to each other, My father, my son, my mother, my daughter, my brother, my sister. And when the voice calls for the dead to arise, suppose I am laid by the side of my father. What would be the first joy of my heart? to meet my father, my mother, my brother, my sister. And when they're by my side, I embrace them and they me. All your losses will be made up to you in the resurrection, provided you continue faithful. By the vision of the Almighty, I have seen it. And I, I find great hope and solace in Joseph's promise that all our losses will be made up in the resurrection. We may lose a lot of things in this life, loved ones, health, comfort, opportunities, maybe even happiness. The resurrection is the great equalizer. All those things are not really lost. They're just being held in reserve for some future date. The resurrection opens the doors of those blessings to us once again. So until that day, I find hope and solace in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I pray that you will too. My second question do you or does somebody you love suffer from any physical or mental illness, disability, or injury? If you said yes, then the atonement is for you. Another comforting truth of the atonement and resurrection is the promise that not only will we overcome death, but the way in which we will overcome it. We won't be resurrected to return to a mortal imperfect body, but rather a glorified, perfect, and immortal body. The Book of Mormon really clarifies this. Alma 11, 43-44 The spirit and the body shall be reunited again in its perfect form. Both limb and joint shall be restored to its proper frame, even as we now are at this time. And even there shall not so much as a hair of their heads be lost, but everything shall be restored to its perfect frame, as it is now, or in the body. I like those two P words that describe the condition in which we'll find our resurrected bodies, their proper and perfect frame. Many of us suffer from diseases, illnesses, and injuries, and our bodies bear the scars and impacts of those things all our lives. Some carry these things from the day that they're born. Some individuals suffer from mental disabilities, social disorders, emotional distresses, Will we continue to face these things in the next life? No. Our bodies will be restored to their proper and perfect form. All diseases we have suffered will no longer afflict us. All disabilities will be gone. Injuries, scars, emotional traumas. All is going to be swallowed up and overcome by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Remember that Joseph Smith promised that all our losses are going to be made up in the resurrection. I consider myself very fortunate that, at this time, I've not been called to bear much in the way of physical ailments. But I realize that that could change at any time. 
I do suffer from debilitating migraines on occasion, though, though that's nothing compared to what many of you face. But they are miserable, and I tell you, I can't wait for the day when I won't need to worry about those anymore. When I receive my resurrected body, that is not going to be part of the package. I really look forward to that. And we will all have that experience. Whatever you face, or your loved ones face, will be healed. Jesus was the great healer in his life, and continues to be the great healer through his death and his resurrection. So, deformities, blindness, asthma, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, dementia, ADHD, depression, multiple sclerosis, autism, PTSD, everything from the most serious to the most common, from the physical to the mental, from the short-lived to the chronic, the resurrection will prevail overall. It's the great panacea. It's the universal cure. My next question, have you ever sinned or wished for a release from guilt? Have you ever needed a release from the burden and weight of past transgression and wished that you could just make that pain go away? Well, the atonement is for you. The power of Christ's atonement makes it possible for you to be forgiven. The first two questions that I asked focused on giving us hope through some future blessing that is going to be available to us after this mortal life. The great thing about these last two questions is that they're blessings available to us now in this life. And this first one, the supreme gift of forgiveness. The Book of Mormon is a book all about forgiveness. It's all over its pages. I'd argue that it's one of the major themes of the Book of Mormon. Story after story of individuals being forgiven. We've got Nephi, Enos, the people of King Benjamin, Alma the Elder, Alma the Younger, King Lamoni, his wife, his father, the anti-Nephi Lehi's, Corianton, the guards that imprison Nephi and Lehi, and on and on and on. The pages of the Book of Mormon abound with beautiful descriptions of forgiveness. And here are just a few of my favorites. When Enos prayed for forgiveness, he received it. And he says, And I, Enos, knew that God could not lie. Wherefore, my guilt was swept away. Christ's atonement can sweep guilt away. It's as if he's standing there with a giant broom, encouraging us to allow him to sweep away the guilt and the pain and the sorrow of our sins, to make the floor of our souls spotless and clean again. Another verse, Mosiah 26, 22. For behold, this is my church. Whosoever is baptized shall be baptized unto repentance. And whomsoever ye receive shall believe in my name, and him will I freely forgive. Not only do we believe in a God that forgives sins, but a God who forgives freely. What a phenomenal word. Freely, as in readily, eagerly, quickly, willingly, abundantly. God loves to forgive his children. He's a good father. Imagine if your child walked into you very humbly and said, Dad or Mom, I've done something wrong and I want to fix it. I want to be good. Will you help me? Can you imagine a father turning that child away or getting angry with them or showing disappointment or disapproval? Not a good parent. And our Heavenly Father is the best father. No, you would help them. You'd counsel them. You'd give them hope and the ability to make things right. As a bishop, when people come in to confess sins to me, that's how I try to approach it. Like a good father, helping his beloved children to get back on the path of happiness and righteousness and giving them all the hope in the world in the process. Another scripture, Mosiah 26.30 Yea, and as often as my people repent, will I forgive them their trespasses against me. That is a reassuring message, as often as my people repent. Sometimes I get the feeling that people expect the overcoming of sins to be easy. Cold turkey, I'm done with this problem, and I'm never going to struggle with it again. Now, sometimes it can and should work that way. But for most things, overcoming sin, habits, addictions, chronic spiritual problems can take time. That's not an excuse, but a reality. We must never get discouraged with ourselves and our efforts to change. 
God certainly isn't going to get discouraged with us. He doesn't give up on those who are trying, who are learning, who are pushing themselves to be better. Those that hunger and thirst after righteousness. God asks us to forgive other people until 70 times 7. And I believe that God would never ask us to do something that he wasn't willing to do himself. I believe that he offers us forgiveness until 70 times 7. Alma 24.11, the Antinephi-Lehi's describe themselves before they're converted unto the Lord. And they say, And now behold, my brethren, since it has been all that we could do, as we were the most lost of all mankind, to repent of all our sins and the many murders which we have committed, and to get God to take them away from our hearts. For it was all we could do to repent sufficiently before God that he would take away our stain. Now, did you catch that? They say that they were the most lost of all mankind, and yet the atonement was able to take away their stain. I think the message is clear. If God can forgive the most lost of all mankind, certainly he can forgive us. And then how can we forget Alma the Younger's description of his forgiveness? And now behold, when I thought this, I could remember my pains no more. Yea, I was harrowed up by the memory of my sins no more. And oh, what joy and what marvelous light I did behold. Yea, my soul was filled with joy as exceeding as was my pain. Yea, I say unto you, my son, that there could be nothing so exquisite and so bitter as were my pains. Yea, and again I say unto you, my son, that on the other hand, there can be nothing so exquisite and sweet as was my joy. Do you see the power of the atonement there? Do you feel the power of the atonement there? It changes everything. Bitterness to sweet, pain to peace, misery to joy, darkness to light. A complete transformation. The atonement has the power to cleanse and free your soul completely. Though it's not a verse found in the Book of Mormon, sometimes I think we struggle with the promise from Isaiah 118, which says, Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. I've heard my dad refer to this idea as pink people. There are those who feel that they can be forgiven, but that they can never become what they could have been had they not sinned. That Christ just couldn't make their scarlet and crimson sins as white as snow or as wool, but just a nice shade of pink. Well, I want you to know that there are no pink people out there. If you've been forgiven, you've been forgiven. The worthiness of your soul stands as if you had never committed the sin in the first place. If God could make the kind of missionary and prophet that he did out of an Alma the Younger, he can certainly forgive your sins and allow you to live up to the fullest of your divine destiny. Sometimes we struggle to forgive ourselves, and to those people I plead, Give Christ the victory over your sins. I know that I've felt the power of forgiveness in my life. We all need it. I'm not a perfect man. Just ask my wife and family. But I find great comfort in the fact that my sins can not only be forgiven, but forgotten. I stand all amazed at the love Jesus offers me. The last question Do you experience difficult challenges, trials, or burdens in your life? Now, these are the kinds of burdens that come to us, not because of bad choices, but the burdens and challenges that just come to all of us in life. I feel that one of the most important and illuminating references on the atonement anywhere is found in Alma chapter 7. If you've ever wanted to understand exactly what the atonement entailed, these verses explain it best. You might remember that Jesus compared his atonement to a bitter cup, like drinking a cup full of something very bitter, like vinegar. Well, what was in that cup? What exactly was he drinking or experiencing during his atonement? See if you can find the eight different words that describe what he was feeling. And what you should come up with is the following. Pains afflictions, temptations, sicknesses, death, infirmities, sins, and transgressions. 
and not only certain kinds of pains and afflictions and temptations, but pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. That would be physical, social, mental, and emotional pains and afflictions. I think we often focus on the fact that Jesus paid for our sins and transgressions, which he did. But sometimes we forget that he also felt all of our pains and sicknesses and infirmities too. And the next question that these verses answer is why? Why did he take these things upon himself? Can you see any answers to that question? That the word might be fulfilled. So one, to fulfill prophecy. That he may loose the bands of death. That his bowels may be filled with mercy. That he may know according to the flesh how to succor his people. That he might take upon him the sins of his people and that he might blot out their transgressions according to the power of of his deliverance. And I'm very intrigued by that fourth reason. I've often asked myself, why would Jesus suffer my pains and my sicknesses? I understand him suffering for my sins and transgressions. Uh, that makes total sense to me. That he pays the full price of justice for my errors to make me right with God again. But why my pains? Why my sicknesses? Don't I still feel those? How does him feeling them help me? And at least part of the answer to that question lies in that verse. One, so that his bowels may be filled with mercy. Ultimately, Jesus is going to be our judge, and he needs to be the perfect judge. Somebody in a court of law could possibly point to the judge after their sentencing and say, How dare you judge me this way? You don't know me. You don't know what I've been through. You don't know what it's like to be in my shoes. And they'd be right. A judge can't know those things for sure. They make their judgment based on the best information that they have. But this judgment concerns the eternity of God's precious souls. This has to be fair. So who is going to do the judging in this case? Somebody that knows you better than you know yourself. Somebody that not only knows what your struggles were like, but has actually been through your struggles, has felt your pains, your trials, your temptations. The atonement makes Jesus the perfect judge, the most fair judge to ever take the stand. It's comforting to me to know that somebody who truly knows me and everything about me is going to be holding that gavel. I don't imagine anybody arguing with the judgments that he pronounces. They're going to be uttered with the perfect balance of justice and mercy. And another reason, that he may know how to succor his people according to their infirmities. The word sucker is an interesting word. It comes from Latin. The root words for sucker suggest running and help or rescue. In other words, Jesus felt these things so that he would know how to run to help you. There are two kinds of I understand that one can speak. If one of the youth from my ward came to my office and said, Bishop Wilcox, I'm really struggling right now. My parents are going through a divorce. Do you have any counsel that might help me? And in that situation, I might say with great sympathy, Oh, I'm so sorry. I understand that that must be very difficult. And then I'd do my very best to counsel them through that difficulty. But of course, they could look back at me and say, Really? Do you really understand? How could you? You haven't been through it, have you? And I'd have to say, No, you're right but I can imagine how difficult it would be. Now, on the other hand, if that same youth went and spoke to my dad and told him the same thing, he could look back at them and say, oh, I understand, that's difficult. And his, I understand, is going to be different than mine. Why? Because that did happen to him when he was young. He does know what that's like. And which of the two I understands is more powerful? The second one, right? It's the difference between sympathy and empathy. And which of the two did Jesus want to be able to say to you? He wanted to be able to say, I understand. And you know what? I actually think that there's a third type of I understand. Jesus's I understand is even more than empathy. It's not just that he understands because he's been through something similar. It's that he has actually been through exactly what we've been through. 
He has suffered our specific pains, our sicknesses, our infirmities. It's the most perfect I understand that can ever be uttered by the lips of another being. And there's an interesting phrase that keeps coming up in there. According to the flesh. Jesus knows our pains according to the flesh. Now look at verse 13. It starts by saying, Now the Spirit knoweth all things. Nevertheless, the Son of God suffereth according to the flesh. What I think that means is that Jesus could have understood our pains through the power of the Spirit, that the Spirit could have communicated that understanding to him. But for Jesus, he didn't want to just understand on a spiritual level. He wanted to understand according to the flesh, completely, absolutely, and in all of its awful reality. Jesus understands like no one else. Therefore, turn to him for help. He can offer help, and he will run to offer that help. And, and maybe you wonder, how is that help offered? I think it can be offered through inspired church leaders. It can be offered through loving friends and family sent by God to help us. It can be offered through the scriptures. It can be offered by actual angels sent to us from beyond the veil. It can be offered through the comforting presence of the Holy Ghost. It can also be offered by an actual lifting or an easing of our burdens. One great example of this is Limhi's people who are in bondage to the Lamanites. And when they humble themselves and cry unto God for help, the scriptures say, The Lord did hear their cries and began to soften the hearts of the Lamanites, that they began to ease their burdens. Yet the Lord did not see fit to deliver them out of bondage. The Lord was able to ease their burdens. Now, he doesn't free them from them, at least not at this time. That comes later. But he helps them and supports them through their trials. I believe that this is possible through the power of the atonement. Later in Mosiah 24, Alma's people are also in bondage to the Lamanites, and they pray for deliverance. And their answer from God? And it came to pass that the voice of the Lord came to them in their afflictions, saying, Lift up your heads and be of good comfort, for I know of the covenant which you have made unto me, and I will covenant with my people and deliver them out of bondage. And I will also ease the burdens which are put upon your shoulders, that even you cannot feel them upon your backs, even while you are in bondage. And this will I do, that ye may stand as witnesses for me hereafter, and that ye may know of a surety that I, the Lord God, do visit my people in their afflictions. And now it came to pass that the burdens which were laid upon Alma and his brethren were made light. Yea, the Lord did strengthen them, that they could bear up their burdens with ease. And they did submit cheerfully and with patience to all the will of the Lord. God can do this kind of thing for us as well. We too can lift up our heads as he eases our burdens, makes them lighter, and strengthens us to bear up under them cheerfully and with patience. And let's not forget that Alma promised that whosoever shall put their trust in God shall be supported in their trials and their troubles and their afflictions and shall be lifted up at the last day. Christ's atonement is not just about forgiving sins. It's about divine help in times of need. Because he felt our burdens, he's able to ease them for us and strengthen us in them. I felt that comforting and easing power in my life. At one point on my mission, I was feeling super discouraged and down. I was struggling with the language, my companion, and the work. I was so far away from home in an unfamiliar place, and I felt 100% alone. I remember looking around the apartment in the dark, and I felt so cold, and I almost could sense that the adversary was laughing at me. Well, I remember crawling out of my bed and kneeling down and praying to God for help, that I didn't feel that I could do this on my own. And as I was kneeling there, it was like somebody put a warm blanket around my shoulders and around my heart. It was as if the whole apartment was filled with his light, even though I was kneeling in the darkness. And it was at that moment that I knew that I was going to be okay, that I was going to get through that because I didn't have to do it alone. The next day and the rest of my mission was different. He eased my burden and strengthened my shoulders. I never felt that darkness and discouragement again. The power of Christ's atonement fortified me. And I felt that he walked with me and he lifted me. 
To me, that's the most wonderful thing about the atonement, the way it makes me feel. It's not necessarily a mind-driven doctrine, but a heart-driven one. Now, if you've spent any amount of time with me as a teacher, you know that I love symbolism and metaphor. One of my favorite metaphors for the atonement is all over the Book of Mormon. See if you can discover what it is by looking at the following scriptures. But behold, the Lord hath redeemed my soul from hell. I have beheld his glory, and I am encircled about eternally in the arms of his love. Behold, he sendeth an invitation unto all men, for the arms of mercy are extended towards them. And he saith, Repent, and I will receive you. Another one, And thus mercy can satisfy the demands of justice, and encircles them in the arms of safety. And then in Mormon, For I know that such will sorrow for the calamity of the house of Israel. Yea, they will sorrow for the destruction of this people. They will sorrow that this people had not repented, that they might have been clasped in the arms of Jesus. What is the Book of Mormon's symbol for the atonement? An embrace. An embrace from Jesus Christ. It's his way of reaching out to us and enfolding us in his arms. So there he stands, arms extended, and inviting you to come unto him. So, my friends, this Easter, my hope and prayer for you is that you will allow yourself to be clasped in the arms of Jesus. He's running to help you, arms wide, to overcome your pains, your sicknesses, your infirmities, your temptations, your sins, your transgressions, even death itself. And just like the people of 3rd Nephi, I believe that there will come a day when we will all have that same experience, that we literally, and not just spiritually or metaphorically, will one by one be embraced by the Savior. And until that day, I encourage you to rely on the merits and the mercy and the grace of the Holy Messiah. And may the miraculous power of the atonement and the resurrection be a personal, meaningful, heart-centered doctrine this Easter and every single day of this year. Well, again, I thank you for inviting me to be a part of your study or your lesson prep. I hope you found value in it. If you did, please share it with somebody that you feel it could help. Thank you for watching, and as always, get out there and teach with power.